Hello guys and welcome to my video. Um, so today we're going to be focusing on the May June 2016 question paper 114 physics and the question paper is 1 hour 15 minutes long. So I'm going to be solving it thoroughly, explaining in detail um, what some of the questions were and how some of the questions were supposed to be answered. So please do like, comment and subscribe if you find my content um, very useful. Okay, so we're going to start off with the first um, question. Okay. So we're given three wires um, that each um, exert a horizontal force that is shown on a vertical pole. So we're given a certain vertical pole and we have three wires that are exerting a horizontal force. Um, which vector diagram shows the resultant force acting on the pole? So before we solve this question, I have a very, very important concept that I would like to teach you guys that you need to know before you even solve this particular question. And it's a concept known as head. Okay, it's a concept known as head um, to tail method. Okay, so basically what this method is about is that if you have two vectors, right? So let's assume um, we have two vectors. Okay, we have vector A, right? And then we have um, vector B. Okay, so here we have two vectors, right? We have vector A and we have vector B. And you want to join them so that you can find the resultant force of these two vectors, right? You're going to apply a method that is known as the head to tail method. So you're going to take the um, the tail of one vector, which is this. This is the tail, right? And then you're going to join it to the head of the other vector. This is the head of this other vector. So you're going to join them head to tail, like so. Okay? So what this method does is it helps you find the resultant force. The resultant force or the resultant vector is going to come from um, from the tail of this vector to the head of this other vector. So the resultant vector so the resultant vector is going to come from here all the way to here, right? So that is going to be um, your resultant vector. So basically, the purpose of this method is that it helps us find the resultant vector. So um, this becomes our resultant vector R, okay? And this was vector A, and um, this was vector B, okay? So you can find the resultant force um, that is acting on any particular system by joining those vectors head to tail. That is basically what this method says, and that is how this method is applied. So if you're looking at this question, we're given three wires, so you want to join them head to tail so that you can be able to find the resultant force. You see where this method is, why this method is very important? Join your vectors head to tail, and if you connect the tail of one vector to the head of the other vector, you're therefore going to have the resultant force. So let's start with A. Is A correct? Is A correct? Let's look at this. This arrow, very much correct. But look at this, guys. This is pointing up, right? That is pointing up. Why is it pointing up? Um, that is very incorrect because here we have a vector that's pointing down, but you have a vector that's pointing up. That is wrong, meaning that um, A is not going to be correct. If you look at B, we have a vector going to that direction, okay? Head to tail, as you can see here, head to tail. Um, we have a vector going down, down. Then here we have head to tail head to tail, that's correct. Then if a vector moving from um, this direction to that direction, and that is correct. And so our answer is going to be um, to be B. But let's go and see if other um, if some of the other answers are also correct, or if those answers are wrong, right? So if you're going to look at C, um, we have a vector going down, okay, that's correct. We have a vector going to the side. But if you look here, our vector is going here, right? Indeed, this is head to tail, head to tail, head to tail, correct. But this vector is going to the right. But here we have a, it's going to the left, sorry. But here we have a vector going to the right. So that's wrong, right? That makes C wrong. Then if you look at um, a D, D again going to the right, going up, going up here, right? That doesn't make sense because our vector should be going down. So D is going to be wrong. So the correct answer therefore has to be, um, has to be B. Um, moving on to question number two. Which pair of physical quantities do not have the same SI base unit? So it's very important for you to know what a base unit is. Before you even solve this question, it is uh, mandatory that you know what exactly is an SI base unit. So it is um, a unit which is fundamental, um, which is comprising of all the units that we actually have, right? And it is made up um, of a lot of things. It cannot be um, composed of anything else. It cannot be broken down any further, right? This can be uh, mass, this can be time, this can be length, this can be um, current. A lot of things which are very fundamental, they make up all the other quantities and their units are therefore referred to as base units. If we look at A, 
Electromotive force, um, let's look at A first, right? If I look at, at A, electromotive force is basically EMF, and then potential difference is basically PD. But this basically means the same thing, right? This is the work done per unit charge. Um, for EMF is per unit charge in driving a current around a complete circuit. So it's driving a unit charge around a complete circuit. That's EMF. Potential difference is the um, work done per unit charge in moving from point A to point B in a circuit, right? But it's not necessarily across the whole circuit. Then the units for work done is force times distance, which is going to be kg, okay, kg, um, m squared, s to the power of negative 2, right? Force, uh, kg, m, s to the power of negative 2 times um, distance, which is m, right? And then q is going to be as, right? Current, um, q is charge, current times time, as, right? You are in as, the units are as, right? Very important. Um, so if you're going to simplify this, this is going to be kg um, m squared, okay, s to the power of negative 3 and a to the power of negative 1, right? Important. Um, let's go to b. Uh, if you look at b, let's move. Um, b, pressure, pressure is basically the force um, per unit area. And stress, stress is also um, the force per unit area applied per unit cross-sectional area. So again, it is the force um, per unit area. What are the units? Force is um, ma, mass times acceleration. That's kg, ms to the power of negative 2, divided by area, which is m squared. That cancels out. So we have kg, um, m to the power of negative 1, s to the power of negative 2. Since they mean the same thing, they're therefore going to have the same units, right? Um, if we move on to d, um, we have spring constant and moment of a force. The spring constant, what do you know? We know that F is going to be equal to Kx. Um, therefore, K is going to be equal to F divided by X, um, where X is just the extension in meters. Um, so we're going to have Kg, M, S to the power of negative 2, divided by extension in meters. That's going to be um, Kg, S to the power of negative 2. Okay, if you look for moment of a force, we know that moment, Okay, moment of a force, the same as torque, is going to be the perpendicular of uh, the force times the perpendicular distance from the line of action um, of the force to the pivot, right? So this is going to be kg um, ms to the power of negative 2 times your distance, which is going to be um, m. That's going to give you um, kg m squared s to the power of negative 2. And you can see, guys, that these do not have the same unit. So your answer um, basically is going to be um, to be c. In this particular case, your answer is going to be C. Then if we move on to the next, we have torque and work um, work done. So your answer is going to be C. Then the last one, we're just going to prove it, right? We have, we have torque um, and work done. Like I've said, torque is also um, force, okay? Force times distance. Um, work is also force um, times distance. And that's also going to be kg um, m, squ uh, m squared s to the power of negative 2, as we have done um, here. So the answer is going to be um, C. Very important, guys. For question three, we're given a lift. If you have ever been in an elevator, as you can see on the screen, an elevator basically works by having two cables um, or more, right? It depends on the kind of elevator. But those cables are basically going to um, move a person up or down, you know, to sort of save time. If it isn't for the elevator, you're going to have to take stairs, right? So we have to really thank the guys who came up with the elevator. Okay, so... The question has asked me to, um, the question has told me that the cables extend by one millimeter when a man of mass 80 kg steps into the lift. What is the best estimate of the value of the young modulus of steel? Okay, so guys, we, we want to move fast and want to be able to calculate this. What do you know about the young modulus, right? Just write what you know and let's start from there, right? The young modulus, um, okay, is equivalent to your stress right? The stress um, divided by the strain, okay? Right? Your stress is how much has your material been stressed? Your strain is how much has it extended per unit length? That gives you sort of a measure that we call the Young modulus, right? So we know that stress is going to be the force per unit area, right? And then the strain is going to be the extension per unit length, right? So that's going to flip. So we're going to have F times the length divided by A times X. Okay, so that's basically um, how we're going to be able to think of this, right? Let's look at this scenario here. 
We're given a lift that is supported by two steel cables, each of length 100 meters and diameter 0 0.5 um, centimeters. Right? So we're given two steel cables. Then we're told that the cables extend by one millimeter when a man of mass 80 kgs steps into the lift. So the person is going to move and move and move. And when they get into the lift, the cables are just going to extend. Right? So what is the force that is causing that extension? That force has to be 800. Right? I know that force. Okay, what do I know? I know that force um, is going to be equal to um, MA, right? And that force is going to be the weight, which is going to be equal to MG, right? The mass is going to be 80 times 9.81. Um, you know, just to simplify things, I'm just going to use 10, right? Remember, there is no mark for calculations here. So I'm just going to use 80 times 10. That's basically just going to give me 800, right? There's no mark for calculation. So we want to make it as simple, simple as possible. Was this an estimate, guys? It's going to be... Um, that's going to just make it fast. But just be in the habit of just using 9.81 um, just in case, okay? So we have um, we have our force here. This is the force that's going to cause the extension, right? What is the length of these cables? So I'm basically going to assume that it is both of these cables that are extending, okay? So um, I have a force, right? So the cables are going to extend by one millimeter. So the length of these cables, right? So the force that is going to um, be experienced by these two cables, right? It's going to be 800, okay? Like, like I've calculated here, right? So I'm going to have 800 times, what is the length of my cables? That's 10. Um, how do I find my area? It's pi d squared over 2, right? That's my area, pi d squared over 2, okay? Um, so um, that, how do I find my area? Area is um, pi r squared. In this case, we have diameter 0 0.5 for one cable. Okay, so we're going to have 2 times pi times um, the um, the dam the radius, which is going to be the diameter 0 0.5 divided by 2, all of that squared, right? Times, what is my extension? 1 millimeter, which is 1 millimeter, um, 1 times 10 to the power of negative 3. Right, so you're going to ask me, why did I put a 2 here, right? You're going to wonder why I put a 2 here. Remember, we have two cables. You could have used a different method, right? They could have shared the weight. That cable could have, could have gotten 400, right? And then the other cable would have gotten 400. So if you're considering one cable, your force was supposed to be 400. Um, your length would be 10. Then your area would just be pi d squared over 4. But the, the mere fact that we have two cables, so we're going to multiply our diameter or our area by two because you are going to imagine that this is sort of acting as one cable, right? So it's sort of like behaving as one cable. So that's basically going to have um, double, you know, the, 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 like so. I sort of assume that it's just behaving as one cable. Right, sort of two cables combined with one cable that has just a diameter of you know um, one centimeter, so 0 0.5 by two. That's why I had this two before. But if you're not going to consider this method, you're just going to um, deal with them separately. But you're going to have to use a force of 400. So let's summarize. Um, Young modulus is stress over strain. We know what stress is. We know what strain is. F per unit, um, force per unit area, extension per unit length. So you're going to substitute. The force is going to be 800. The person enters with a force of 800 newtons, causing the lift to extend, the cables to extend by one millimeter. So you're going to multiply the area by two if you're going to assume that the cables are behaving as one thing. If they are not, you're going to consider each cable separately. You're going to have to use a mass of 400 newtons. Then you're going to get an answer. Um, if you make a calculation, you're going to get an answer of 2 times 10 to the power um, of 11, which is going to be um, C. Very important, guys, for you to be thinking of that. Move on to the next question. When performing an experiment, a student should minimize the uncertainty um, in an um, they should minimize the uncertainty of any measurement. In which case is the student reducing the systematic error um, in a measurement? So what um, what is a systematic error? It's basically an error that is caused by the uh, measuring instrument. So it's an error in the measuring instrument that is always constant. It never changes, right? So if a person is adjusting a voltmeter reading, so if a person is adjusting a voltmeter needle um, to zero before um, using it, right, to measure potential difference, so basically that's zeroing, right? You're zeroing it. But by measuring the diameter of a wire at several points, 
and orientations, your whole goal is to reduce a random error, which is an error due to an individual themselves. The instrument is not at fault, right? So an instrument is, we only blame an instrument when it's a systematic error. The system itself has an error. But if it's other error, it's random, right? It's you as an experimenter that is at fault. So measuring the diameter reduces a random error. So this is random, um, and that is not necessarily correct. Um, measuring the mass of 100 paper clips to determine the mass that is also random um, because you might make an error in measuring one so you're going to measure 100 of them in order to improve it timing 20 oscillations that's also random so whenever you do a lot of things right let's make a generalization whenever you do a lot of things with the aim of being more accurate that's random because you're going to make an error as an individual but whenever it's an instrument that is adjusted so that it can be more accurate um, that is going to be systematic so the answer is going to be a Move on to question five. The calibration graph is produced by a 40, uh, for a 40 ammeter. So we have an ammeter um, that is now 40, right? So that's an ammeter and it's 40. And we want to find the ammeter reading, which will be nearest to the true um, current. So we have an ammeter reading that we need to find. Okay, so let's start at 0 0.2, right? So we're going to have an ammeter reading of 0 0.2. So how many things do we have here? I have one, two, three, four. 5. So if I divide this by 5, I'm going to get 0 0.2. So it means here I'm going to have 0 0.2. Here, here, I'm going to have 0 0.4. Here, I'm going to have 0 0.6. Here, I'm going to have 0 0.8. So let's start at 0 0.2. At 0 0.2, um, here I have a true value, which is again, let's go here. Um, so on this side, I'm going to go again and say, at 0 0.2, I have way less than you know, 0 0.2. It's nowhere near the true current. That's wrong. 0 0.4 um, is nowhere near again the true current, which is supposed to be 0 0.4. 0 0.6, if we go here, nowhere near the true uh, current. But if we go to 0 0.8, 0 0.8, we go here. Here we have indeed, we have 0 0.8. So that is very, very close to the true current, right? Indeed, that is actually the true current. So the amateur reading of 0 0.8 is nearest to the true current that is actually present in the scenario. So your answer is going to be um, D. Move on to question nine. We're given a car that accelerates uniformly from a velocity u to a velocity v. So we have a car, right? Um, that is your car, and that car is going to accelerate. What is acceleration? Acceleration is the change in velocity per unit time. So acceleration basically means that the object is going to experience a change in in the velocity. The velocity is going to increase. It was once 10 meters per second, now it's going to be 20 meters a second. So the driver is, is stepping on the accelerator of the car and the car starts to move, right? So we want to find the area um, we've been asked on the graph which area equals the distance traveled by the car in time t, okay? So what do we know? I know that this is a fact, guys. This is something that you just need to know, right? NB, right? The area, okay? The, okay, so the area under a velocity time graph represents displacement, and the area underneath um, a speed time graph represents distance. But displacement and distance are basically the same thing. What's different is just the name. So we want to find um, the distance traveled. So basically, it's going to be this area. So I'm just going to shade it here. Okay, so it's just going to be um, this whole area right here. Okay, so basically, this is basically the distance that we need. So we have to find which of the answers A, B, C, D just resembles this particular scenario. And once we have it, we're done, right? So if we look at um, A, we have N, P, T, U. N, P, T, U. So it's basically this whole region, okay? P, Q, S, T. P, Q, S, T. P, Q, S, T. Come on, guys, this is wrong, right? This doesn't make sense. How can this be the yellow region? We just want to find which represents the yellow region. That is basically not correct, right? Um, for, for B, we have NPWV. NPWV, okay. We have uh, VRSU. V, where is V? VRSU, okay. Um, okay. So you realize, if you look at this, we have this region A, right, that is missing. That wasn't accounted for. But I want you to look at this. Isn't this similar to this? Come on, guys. Aren't these two things similar? So by me taking V, R, S, U, am I not accounting for this, which is not in any purple region? Am I not accounting for it? I am. So it means that the answer is going to be B. 
because I have to account for this region. So by going above here, I've, I've accounted for this region, which wasn't being accounted for um, before. Okay. Very important for you to be just thinking about this kind of scenarios when you're um, doing your calculations. Okay. PWV, that's this NPWV. We have uh, WRST, WRST, this region. <laughs> nah, that's not correct. Because we've eliminated this. This is not enough to substitute this whole big thing, right? Um, what else do we have? We have PST. Um, we have PST. PST, that's this. Okay. Then we have um, PQS, PQS, that's this. Yeah, that's not enough because we've looked at all this area that we have eliminated. If this was going to substitute this, um, yeah, that doesn't work out, right? So the answer is going to be B. Move on to question seven. A student uses a spring gun to launch a steel bow. So the student has a gun, bah, they, they're launching a steel bow with a horizontal velocity, right? Then he varies the height H of the gun Okay, so the height H, which is this basically, and then he measures the horizontal displacement R of the bow when it hits the ground. Which variations, uh, which graph shows the variation with height H of the horizontal displacement R. So guys, we're going to go through a bit of a mathematics lesson, right? I love mathematics. And by understanding mathematics, you can be able to understand physics because those two are very related, like, like very related. Okay, so we're going to go to graphs. And I really want you to pay attention, guys. One of the first graphs you're going to encounter in physics is a graph of direct proportion. Y is direct proportional to X. Basically expressed in the form of Y is going to be equal to KX. So this graph is basically going to be a graph like so. It is a graph which is just going to be a straight line. So it's going to be a straight line from here. I'm going like this. That's basically going to be your graph, right? So the graph is going to be a straight line. Um, we can have scenario two. Okay, a graph of inverse proportionality. Y is inverse proportional to X, like so. Um, it can also be just Y is equal to K over X. K can be any constant, guys. Um, so this is just going to be a graph like so. Um, so it's going to be like this. Okay, this is a graph of inverse proportionality um, that you're going to see. What other graph do we have? Um, we have another graph, number four, that you might see. Um, of y is directly proportional to x squared, right? Or y is going to be equal to k x squared. It's a graph of um, um, of squared root relationships. Okay, so you're going to be given an axis that will be just like this. Okay, like so. So a graph of x squared passes through the origin. It's a graph like this. It's going to pass through the origin. Then it's going to go, it's going to go like this, right? Because y is equal to x squared, it's going to be a graph like this. So if you're just going to take one region, it's just going to be this particular graph, right? Okay, so this is number three. Sorry, why am I saying number four? Um, this is number three. Okay. Okay. Um, then we go to number four. You're going to have a graph of y that's going to be directly proportional to the square root of x, right? We're just because, uh, going to be a graph of y is equal to k, the square root of x. Okay, so we're going to put our axes um, here. Okay, so if we have our axes, um, okay, like so. This is a graph that's going to look like this. Okay, this is a graph that's going to look like this, right? So these are some of the graphs that you're going to um, encounter in physics. They can always be much more. My, my, my whole point of this is to say, with mathematics, you just have to understand it, and it will help you in physics. For example, if I'm looking at this, D indicates a direct proportionality relationship. If you look at D, this is a direct proportionality relationship. If you look at B, this is a what? A squared relationship. Y is directly proportional to X squared. If you look at C, the same relationship is just translated in the, I mean, the Y axis. If you've done math, you know translation, right? Um, so, but it's still a graph of Y is equal to KX squared. If you look at A, it's a graph of Y is equal to the square root of X. So if you have this knowledge of graphs, you can deduce a relationship between R and H. And once you have a relationship that can just tell you instantly what graph do you need. So this is where your physics knowledge now comes into play. What is the relationship? And once you have a physics background of knowing what is the relationship, you can therefore be able to write um, or to represent the graph that you need. So guys, let's look at this. Let's look at this question, right? Okay. Okay, so we're going to go here. 
um, and we're going to start off with our relationships, right? Let's start with our physics. Okay, I know that R is the range, right? It's going to be the vertical velocity Vx times time, okay? Then I know the height. height. I have S is equal to ut plus half um, at squared. But I know that u is going to be zero initially. There's going to, not going to be a vertical velocity because h is in the vertical. There's not going to be a vertical velocity when you're beginning. So it's going to be zero. So you're just going to have h being equivalent to half um, at squared. Okay? But I know that r is equal to vxt. So I know that from this equation, t is going to be equal to r over vx. So here I'm going to have h being equivalent to one half a times um, r over vx squared. So I'm going to have h being equivalent to one half a um, r squared over vx squared. A is constant, and if you know this, vx is always going to be constant. The horizontal velocity always remains the same. Why? There is no acceleration in the horizontal. Okay. So you're going to left with h is directly proportional to r squared, right? Square both sides. You're going to have r is directly proportional to the square root of h. Right, which is the same as y on the y-axis, it's directly proportional to the square root of x on the x-axis, on the x-axis. So you're going to look for a graph which gives you this relationship, and like I've told you, um, in this relationship, this is going to be um, A. Okay, we're given two cars x and y. Question 8, that are positioned is shown at time t is equal to 0. They're traveling in the same direction, x is 50 meters behind y, and has a constant velocity of 30 meters per second. Y has a constant velocity of 20 meters per second. And what is the value of T um, when X is a level with Y? This is, um, this is going to be fun, right? I really love these kind of questions. They are very, very popular in physics. And I'm going to teach you in such a way that you're going to answer almost any question that you see on overtaking cars, right? This is so fun. Okay, so we're going to go overtaking, um, overtaking car scenario. Okay, right. This is a very, very important scenario that you're going to meet in physics a lot. So let's talk about it. You have two cars, X and Y. So you're going to have a Ferrari. Okay, if you like cars, you're going to have a Ferrari. Um, okay, then you're going to have a Nissan, right? An old, old Nissan. Okay, we have two cars. It's a fact. A Ferrari is faster than a Nissan, right? That's a fact. So because of this fact, the driver of the Ferrari is going to say, you know, you're a Nissan, right? I'm going to allow you to go fast as much as you want. So I'm going to give you a head start. So move fast, move fast, then I'll follow later. But I'm going to follow at a very faster speed than you, right? Okay, so the, the Ferrari is constant, right? The Nissan begins to move, right? The Nissan moves, the Nissan moves. After the Nissan has moved a distance of um, 50 meters, Right after the, the Nissan has moved a distance of 50 meters, okay, it's just moving now at 20 meters per second. So it's still just moving at 20 meters per second, right? But after it has moved 50 meters, the Ferrari is gonna set, is gonna start, right? So it has a faster speed. It's moving at 30 meters per second, okay? So it's gonna be traveling, 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 traveling. So it first has to overcome the 50 meters. Then it needs to travel in such a way that it's gonna me match the Nissan. Right? So the Ferrari needs to move fast. The Nissan is, is not going to be constant, right? So the Ferrari is going to keep on moving, but at a very faster velocity. Then the Nissan is also going to be moving at a very slower velocity, but it had a head start. So there's going to be there's going to come a point. We want to find the value of the time when X is level with Y. So there's going to come a point where the Ferrari and the Nissan are equal. They've arrived. At the, they've traveled the same distance from the starting point. This is the starting point. Right? This is the starting point. So it's going to come at a point where they've traveled the exact same distance from the starting point. Okay? And we need to talk about that um, the time. How much time is it until the Ferrari and the Nissan are equal? After that, the Ferrari will just be moving faster. Right? So what I want to find is basically this distance x. What I want to find is this distance x when they are level. Right, so they're gonna be level. Level meaning that they're gonna be equal at a specific distance x. So we just want we just want to find that distance. So they're gonna travel the same, um, the same distance. Okay, 
and basically that is what we need um, to talk about right so let's do our calculations right so let's remove everything here so I hope that visual aid was very helpful so we have the same distance right that's gonna be traveled by the Ferrari and our Ferrari is going to be X okay must be equal to the same distance right or to the distance basically that is going to be traveled by y our nissan okay so we know that distance basically but you know this is something just we that we just know we know that distance s is going to be equal to velocity times time because the velocity is constant there is no acceleration guys so the uh, the displacement is going to be your velocity times your time so x is going to start with 30 so 30 times a specific time t that's basically going to be the distance traveled by x but this distance must be equal to y is going to travel 50 meters right first then it's going to travel 20 but for a specific period of time t so after a time t right the ferrari would have traveled 30 times that time it's going to have a specific distance and then y is going to travel for a specific period of time again because that's when we're starting the timer right so it's going to be traveling 20 times t but since there's an advantage of 50 there's going they're going to be added up together okay so we're going to have 30t uh, minus 20t that's going to be equal to 50 so this is going to be 10t um that's going to be equal to 50 so therefore t is going to be equal to 50 divided by 10 which is going to be equal to 5 seconds and this makes sense after 5 seconds the ferrari has traveled 30 times 5 150 meters after five seconds uh, when you started timing when the ferrari was moving the car is traveled 20 times t 20 times 5 is 100 but it was already had a 50 meters advantage so it's going to be 150 so their distance is going to be equal after that the ferrari is therefore going to travel faster because imagine if t is now 10 right 30 times 10 that's 300 20 times 10 is 200 200 plus 50 is 250 the ferrari is now just faster than than the nissan so Summary, whenever you're given a scenario about same distance, always start by saying the car that is going to be traveling faster, velocity times time. Then you're, that's going to be equal, they're going to travel the same distance, that's going to be equal to the distance that the other car already had as an advantage, plus the time times its velocity. And you can therefore be able to find the time t. I hope that um, that makes sense. Move on to question number nine. Um, which statement about a perfectly elastic collision between two uh, bodies in an isolated system is correct? This is again a um, system in a perfect elastic collision, both total kinetic energy and total momentum are conserved. So the answer is A. Um, moving on to question 10. Two spheres approach each other along the same straight line. Their speeds are U1 and U2 before they collide. After the collision, they separate with certain velocities. Um, the collision is perfectly elastic, which equation must be correct? I want you to get this, guys, and I want you to get this now. If objects travel in the same direction, okay? If objects travel in the same direction, what do you do? S stands for subtract. S stands for you subtract, okay? You subtract their velocities, right? To get um, the relative speed of approach or separation, okay? And if they're traveling in opposite direction, right? Um, if they're traveling in opposite direction, um, what are you going to do? You're going to subtract. You're going to add, sorry. Um, add. So I, I, usually use this, I usually use these two Ps. So they basically remind me of two Ds. So I basically add um, velocities. Okay. Um, to get the relative okay the relative um speed so this is a shortcut shortcuts are very important in paper one because they sort of speed up time whenever you see bodies moving in the same direction what are you going to do you're going to subtract their velocities you get the relative speed if it's after collision it's relative speed of separation if it's before collision it's relative speed of um of approach the claim is that um, you know, the claim is that 
whenever you add velocities um okay so they claim that for elastic collision the relative speed of approach is equal to the relative speed of separation. And if they move in opposite directions, you're going to add the velocities to get the relative speed. This is the shortcut that you always use whenever you see a question about elastic collisions. But why is this shortcut true? I really don't like just giving people things to memorize and cram. I want people to understand why certain things are true. And if you think about this, if you have a car, right? If you have two cars, car A, okay, if you have car A um, and car B, Right, that are moving towards each other. So basically we can say that they are moving in opposite directions, right? Because one is moving to the uh, left, the other to the right. So basically these are moving in opposite directions. Okay, if you have car C and car D that are moving in the same direction, right? So you have car C and car D that are moving in this direction, like so. Okay, this is basically the same direction, opposite, same, right? The claim is, if they're moving the same direction, they're going to subtract their velocities to get the relative speed of separation. Think about this. If one car is moving at 30 meters per second and the other car is moving at 10 meters per second, so it's, it looks as if the relativity of their velocities is 10 meters, right? Because 30 times times 10, I'm um, sorry, if car D is moving at um, 10 meters per second and car C is moving at 2 meters per second, the difference is going to be 8. Relative to each other, they are moving at 8 meters per second because this one travels 10, this one travels 2. So there's always going to be an 8 that is going to be the gap between them. So whenever they're moving in the same direction, if I subtract their velocities, I get the relative speed. But if they're opposing each other, imagine A and B, they're clashing, they're coming towards each other. This one is moving at 10 meters per second. This one is moving at 30 meters per second. So it's going to be 40 in a way because they want to collide. right? So it's going to be 40. Because imagine this. If A travels 10, B has traveled 30. right? So they're sort of helping each other to reach a collision. So 10 plus 30 is 40. So the relative velocity is going to be 40. This one is moving 30. This one is moving 10. The addition is 40. Then they collide. So whenever things are moving in opposite directions, we add. Same directions, we subtract. If we look at this before collision, is are these opposite directions? They are. Opposite means we add u1 plus u2. Are these traveling the same direction? Yes. Same directions means what? We subtract, right? Anything. You subtract the bigger one minus the smaller, right? That's the easiest one. Um, v2 minus v1. We don't really know which one, but we just use our answers. So if u1 plus u2, um, v1, v2 minus v1, your answer is going to be um, d. Very important for you to be thinking of that. Move on to question 11. The shows a man standing on a platform that is attached to a flexible pipe. Water is pumped through the pipe so that the man and the platform remain at a constant height. The resultant vertical velocity on the platform is zero. The combined mass of the man and the platform is 96 kgs. The mass of the water that is discharged vertically downwards from each platform um, each second is 40 kgs. What is the speed of the water um, leaving the platform? So, I'm going to start with what I'm given. The first easy piece of information to decode is this one. The resultant vertical uh, force on the platform is zero. What does this mean? What are the forces that are acting in the vertical? This man and this platform have a weight. Okay, have a weight that is acting downwards. Okay, they have 96 kgs in combination. So their weight is going to be equal to mg is going to be equal to 96 times 9.81. So this is going to be 941.76 newtons. Okay, so this is going to be the weight of this thing that is acting down. But if the resultant vertical force on the platform is zero, what does this mean? It means that the force that is exerted by the water, we need a force that is going to move up. Okay? Because if it's going to move down, there should be an upward force on the platform that is um, equal and um, equal in magnitude to the weight. And this vertical force is the force that is going to cause the momentum of the water to change. It's the force that's going to cause the momentum of the water to change. Right? So we need a force that's going to be acting up. Right, that's going to be equal 
to the force acting down so that the resultant for vertical force on the platform is zero okay and this is very true if you look at it this way um imagine you ha you have a helicopter and the helicopter is just hovering at a very stationary point it's going to be pushing air downwards and that air that is going down is going to be enough to support the the, the helicopter's weight that is acting down so the weight the air is going to be pushed down but there's going to be a force up right there's going to be acting on those blades that's going to be acting up there's going to be supporting the weight that will be acting down right so sort of saying that the water is it's going down right it's going to exert a force because it's going to be pushing down then it's going to exert an equal opposite reaction force that's going to be acting up then that force that's going up is going to be um equal to the weight that is going to be going down but what you just need to know is that we have a weight that is going down and for the resultant vertical force to be zero the force that is going to be acting on the water to change its momentum should be equal right so what but what do, what do i know i know that force okay force is the rate of change of momentum right so force is the change of momentum change of momentum divided by time that is basically what force is so force is going to be equal to um, a change in momentum times velocity right sorry a change in momentum which is momentum is mass times velocity divided by time Right? But we have something very interesting that I really like about this equation. We don't know what's changing. There are two things that can change momentum. It's either mass can change momentum or the velocity can change momentum. right? Or both can be changing and the momentum will be changing. So in this case, the, the speed is constant because we've just been asked the speed of water leaving the platform. But the mass is going to be changing every second. Every second the mass is changing. Right? So we're going to have a change in mass, okay, divided by time. Every second, 40 kgs comes out, the mass is changed. 40 kgs comes out, 40 kgs comes out, that's a change in mass, right? Times a specific velocity is going to be equal to your force, okay? If the mass was constant and the velocity was changing, change in velocity divided by time would be the acceleration, and F would be equal to mass. That's where the equation comes from. But if the mass is changing and the velocity is constant, F will be equal to the change in mass divided by time times a velocity. Right? So in this case, our change in mass is 40 times the velocity V. Our force is 941.76. So the value of V is going to be equal to 941.76 divided by 40. That's going to be um, a value of V of 23. Um, five four four meters per second that's basically just going to be 24 um, meters per second that's going to be um c what is the key takeaway what, what do i want you to take away f is equal to the change in momentum over time but two factors can affect momentum mass or velocity velocity can change mass being constant f is equals to mass times acceleration the mass can change with the velocity being constant F is going to be the change in mass over time times V. In this case, we're given the change in mass over time. Because look at this. This is mass. This is kgs per unit time. The change in mass per unit time. Right? So, it's going to be 40 divided by... Um, so, it's going to be 40, right? Divided by um, one second. Times the velocity V, which is constant, which is the speed of the water is just leaving on the platform. But the force... <coughs> that is causing this momentum to change is basically going to be the force that is equal to the force acting down so that it can be able to support the platform. So our force from this question is going to be 96 times 9.81 and hence we can find V. And I want to talk about a scenario where both mass and velocity are changing. You're just going to be say F is going to be equal to your mass change in velocity divided by time plus your velocity change in mass divided by time so basically this is what you use if both of those things are changing but if one thing is changing if mass changes okay if mass changes you just gonna have f is going to be equal to the change in mass divided by time times a velocity if the velocity changes but the mass is constant 
right? If velocity changes, but mass is constant, your F is just going to be your change in velocity divided by time times your mass. Popularly known as F is going to be equal to mass times acceleration. So those are the three things that I want you to know. Case one, both are changing. Case two, mass changes, velocity constant. Case three, velocity changes, mass is constant. If you use these equations in any question that you see that has a change, usually you see this change in, in mass per unit time, and you're asked to find a velocity that's constant. Just use this equation, guys. The force, you'll find it in the question, and you can therefore be able to calculate um, anything that you'd want. Very important. Move on to the next question. Forces are applied on a rigid body. The forces all act in the same plane, in which diagram is the body in equilibrium. There are two cases that you need to know. There are two. Okay, two um, conditions. Okay, now let me put it over there. There are two conditions for equilibrium. The first one, the resultant force. Okay, the resultant force is zero. The second one, the resultant torque, the resultant torque is zero. Right? The resultant torque can also be just known as the resultant moment. Then a body is in equilibrium. If the resultant force is zero and the body is not rotating in any way whatsoever, the resultant torque is zero, that body is said to be in equilibrium. So the first thing that we're going to move around is check if the resultant force is equal. If you look at A, um, we have a force going up. Okay, We have a force going up here. Right, Half, half F half F, that's F in total, F up, F up, the right, so the resultant force is going to be equal to zero, that's true. But what about the resultant torque? So let's find a pivot, let's just use the center as my pivot. So if I'm here, okay, if I'm here, this is going to be X, and then this is also going to be X, but this is a clockwise, guys, this is a clockwise moment, then this is an anti-clockwise moment, right? And then I know that the sum of the anti-clockwise moments should be equal to the clockwise moments for your body to be in equilibrium. So one half um, Fx should be equal to one half Fx, and that's true. So it means that the resultant torque is zero. Clockwise, we have half X, anti-clockwise, we have half X, that gives you a resultant torque of zero, right? So the resultant torque um, or moment is going to be equal to zero. So the answer has to be A automatically. You don't need to do all the other ones. We just do them because I want you to see. But basically, your answer would be already be satisfied. Um, if you move to B, right, we have um, F up, F up, F down, F down. So the resultant forces are balanced. Um, so FR, okay, in this case, FR is going to be equal to zero. The resultant force is zero. But the torque, if we go in the center, okay, these cancels out, right? So it's zero, sure. But this, this is anti-clockwise, which is Fx. So the anti-clockwise moments is going to be um, Fx. But the clockwise, this again, is also anti-clockwise. So we have two Fx in anti-clockwise, but there is no clockwise moment whatsoever. So the resultant torque is not equal to zero. So B is wrong. Then if you move to C, we have um, 2F up and F down. So the resultant force is not equal to zero. That is wrong. If we move to D, if we go at the center, here you have half X that is anti-clockwise, sure. But you also have half X that is also anti-clockwise. And you have two half, F, half Fx's. So you're just going to be F, Fx in the anti-clockwise. But if you look at the clockwise, we only have half F here. So this is the only clockwise moment that we have. So we have, so it's not equal. So we're going to have a resultant anti-clockwise moment. So the resultant torque is not going to be zero, meaning that D is going to be wrong and your answer will just be um, A. Very important. Move on to question 13. Um, we've been given a solid metal cylinder that stands on the surface of water. We have that cylinder, we have an area with a surface. The cylinder's length X and cross-sectional area A. 
the cylinder exerts a pressure P. So it's going to push on the surface. It's going to cause a certain force per unit area. And the pressure of free fall is G. Sorry, the acceleration of free fall is G. Which expression gives the density of the metal of the cylinder? What do you know? We know that density, okay. Um, we know that density is basically equivalent to mass, okay, mass divided by volume, right? There's a fact. This is something that we just know. So density is going to be your mass divided by your volume. But I know that pressure, okay, pressure P is going to be equal to your force divided by your unit area. But what is the force that is exacting here? The force that is acting here is going to be mg, right? So my pressure is going to be equal to mg divided by my area A. Okay, what else do I know? I therefore know that um, my mass, okay, my mass is going to be equal to my pressure times my area divided by g. So I can substitute this right here, okay? So I'm going to have my pressure right times a over g divided by v okay so i'm gonna have my pressure times a over g times one over v so you flip v one over v then you multiply okay um so we're gonna have my pressure times a divided by g times v but I know that volume, okay, is equal to, for a cylinder, it's pi r squared L. So it's going to be your area, right, which is your cross-sectional area, times your length L. Okay, in this case, the length is x. So your area times x. So I can remove V and put area times x. So I'm going to have my pressure times my area divided by G times a times x a and a cancel out so i'm left with my pressure divided by g times x where are you where are you pressure over g times x that's going to be b right so that's going to be um the correct answer which is b move on to question 14. given a trailer of weight 30 kilonewtons that is attached to a cab at x as shown in the diagram Okay, um, what is the upward force exerted at X by the tr cab um, on the trailer? What is the upward force exerted at X by the cab on the trailer? So we need an upward force um, at X. So let's put that upward force here. Okay, so let's make it a little bit straighter. Um, so we need an upward force here. Okay, so it's set in force F, right? Um, okay. So how do you find F, right? So let's find let's find a pivot. What pivot do we use? Okay, I'm going to use this as my pivot P. You can use any point you want, guys. The pivot is just a point where you can use as a rep reference frame. So I'm going to use this as my pivot. Okay? So it means that the clockwise moments, right? The clockwise moments must be equal to the anti-clockwise moments. Why? Because if that wasn't true, this whole cab would just flip over. Right, in just 10. So it means that the clockwise moments, right, due to the clockwise forces must be equal to the anti-clockwise moments for this pivot to just remain on the road. Okay? So we're going to have F. So if we look at F, the distance for F is going to be 10 meters here and 10 meters here. So that's going to be 20 meters. So it's F times 20. Your anti-clockwise is going to be um, 10 times 30. Right? Turn times that distance for 30. Right? So F is going to be 10 times 30 divided by 20, that's going to be 15 kilonewtons. 15 kilonewtons, your answer is B. I'll move on to question 15. The diameter of a solid metal sphere is measured using a micrometer screw gauge. That's a micrometer screw gauge. Um, the diagram shows an enlargement of the shaft. Okay. What is the density of the metal used to make the sphere? Okay. I know that for a sphere, um, density, like I've said, is basically mass divided by volume. Mass, I have it, 0 0.450, right, times 10 to the power of negative 3 in kgs, right, divided by my volume. Okay, but I know that, um, divided by my volume, what's happening? Okay, 
but I know that for a sphere, okay, but but um for a sphere. Okay, the volume is going to be equal to 4 over 3 pi r cubed. A formula that you must know, guys. Okay, um, but this is giving me the diameter of this sphere. So I know that the radius is just going to be equal to the diameter divided by 2. Right? Basically, the diameter divided by 2. But how do I find the, radi the diameter from this diagram? I just need to know how to read a micrometer screw gauge. So this is going to be a little crash course, a little 30 second crash course on how to read a micrometer screw gauge. So if you look at this, so if you look at this, how you read a micrometer screw gauge is you first start by looking at this line here. Okay, so you first start by looking at this horizontal line, then you look at this, we have four. So you're going to start with four, right? Then you have this line. Whenever you see this line at the bottom that is visible, so you can see at 3, 3.54, right? So whenever it's visible, it means you add that 0.5. If it's not visible, you don't. As simple as that. So it's going to be 4.50. So if it's there, 4.5. If it's not, you don't. 4.0. Then you look at here, you look where it's aligning. In this case, it's going to be aligning here. So you have 30, so it's going to be aligning here at 31. So you're going to be adding 0 0.31, right? Because 31 is much smaller. It's an increment. It's a measurement. So it's going to be very, very much smaller, always 0 point something. If it was on, let's say here, I don't know, maybe let's say here, it's going to be 0 0.21, 0 0.20, 0 0.2, something like that. Then you add these two things up. So you're going to get 4.81, okay? Millimeters. You always get this thing in millimeters, guys. Very important for you to be thinking of that. So your radius, if you go here, your radius is going to be equal to, okay, 4.81 divided by 2, which is going to be equal to 2.405. Okay, so if I go here, I can therefore just find my density. So in this case, my density, okay, will be equal to um, 0 0.450 times 10 to the power of negative 3 divided by 4 over 3 times pi times um, 2.405 times 10 to the power of negative 3, all of that cubed, right? 10 to the power of negative 3, because it's in millimeters, guys. So your density, if you calculate that on your calculator, is going to be 7,720 kilograms per cubic meter. Your answer is going to be um, C. Very important. Move on to the next question. Um, question number 16. Okay. Some gas in a cylinder is supplied with thermal energy Q. The gas does useful work in expanding at a constant pressure P from volume V0 to volume Vf, as shown. What is the efficiency of this change? What do I know? First, we need a bit of a definition of what efficiency is. Okay, so efficiency can be basically the work output. What do you get out? Right, that's basically efficiency. The work output divided by the work input. What did you put in? Right, or efficiency can also be the work, um, right, or, or it can also be in, a, in in measurement of power. So it can also be the power output, right, divided by the power input. Right, that will still be just e efficiency. So in this case, what is our power input? We have put Q. That is the thermal energy that we have supplied. But what is our work output? For a piston, um, work is going to be, okay, your pressure times your change in volume. Okay, so this is a formula that we use. Whenever a gas is expanding, it's going to be your pressure times your volume. But why, why is this true? Because I don't like memorizing formulas. I want you guys to understand. I really don't like memorizing formulas. So, what do I know? I know that work done is going to be equal to force times distance, okay? So work done will be a force times a change in distance from moving from point A to point B, okay? But I know that volume is going to be your area times your change in distance, right? Or your change in X. So your change in X here is just going to be volume divided by area, which is going to be, so your change in volume 
is going to be your times your change in x, right? Or in this case, just a change in d, right? So I can just refer to this as a change in x. So I can remove that change in x. I'm going to have my work being equal to my force times a change in v divided by a. But you know that the area is constant. The force that will be acting will be constant. Then that force divided by the area will give you your pressure. So work done by gas will be equal to your pressure times your change in volume. Okay, so here we're going to have your pressure, which is constant, your pressure times your change in volume, which is your final volume minus your initial volume. Then that answer is going to be um, C. Right, so that's always very important um, for you to be um, to be thinking of that. We're on question 17. The power required to move an object through a medium at constant speed depends on speed V and resistive force F acting on the object. The resistive force F also depends on the speed V, um, which role possibly shows a possible relationship between speed V, resistive force F, and power P. Okay. There are two methods that I want you guys to understand. The second method is a pretty complicated method, but it's very much understandable if you're, you're, um, you have an understanding of mathematics to some degree. Okay, there's a formula that we know for resistive force. I know that the resistive force is equal to half, okay, um, C, the density times the area, times the velocity squared. So, but in other words, what you, what you just know is that the resistive force is directly proportional to V squared. Right? The resistive force is directly proportional to V squared. There's going to come a question which says draw a graph for the resistive force and the speed. It's going to be Y is equal to X squared. Like I've told you about graphs, right? So it's basically something that you just need to understand. So guys, where does this formula come from? There are some cases where it has been proven. Right? Experiments have been conducted and it has been shown that the resistive force is directly proportional to the velocity squared. Okay? But, so it means that F will just be equal to K um, V squared. So this was a fact that you're just supposed to know that the resistive force is directly proportional to the velocity squared. But, okay, I know that power is basically equal to, um, you know, work done per unit time. But I know that the work done is going to be your force times your distance divided by your time, right? Your distance divided by time, that's FV, right? So power, okay, is going to be equal to FV. But I say that F is goes to KV squared, right? But F is going to be equal to KV squared. So your power is going to be equal to F. You, so you remove that F and you put KV squared. Um, kv squared times v so your power will be equal to kv cubed so your force is proportional to v squared but your power is proportional to v cubed so your force is proportional to v squared but your power is proportional to v cubed so your answer is going to be d but what if i didn't know this formula v is equal to half c um times density c is just a constant um, of resistance and and the density and area in v squared. What if what if I didn't know that the resistive force is a proportion of the v squared? What would I do? Okay, what I would do is I would look at this. I've been told that the resistive force f depends on the speed v. I would start by creating relationships, but I don't know to what extent. I don't, I know it just relates to v, but I don't know is it v squared, v cubed. I don't know that. So I'll just go and say my f is directly proportional to v to the power of n. I don't know if it's v squared, v cubed, I don't know all that, but I just know it's related to v. Um, n can be 0, n can be 1, n can be 2. But I know that the force is related to the velocity. Okay. Therefore, f will be just be equal to kv to the power of n. But then I know that power is going to be equal to fv. So power will just be equal to kv to the power of n times v, right? Which is power is going to be equal to kv n plus 1. Right, because this is v to the power of 1. And if you multiply in indices, you add n plus 1. So your power is going to be directly proportional to the power of n plus 1. Okay. Um, and your force is going to be directly proportional to v to the power of n. So it means that if v is 1, if v is directly proportional to v, power should be proportional to v squared. Okay. And if v is proportional, if f is proportional to v squared, your power should be proportional to v cubed. There must always be a difference of 1. 
So if uh, the force is proportional to V, power should be V squared, wrong. V, V squared, wrong. V squared, V cubed, wrong. V squared, V cubed, correct. So those are the two methods. You could either use just mathematics, uh, creating relationships. You don't know to what extent, but you can be able to create a relationship like I did over there, right? V uh, to the power of N. But if you just know this, but I would really recommend you just know this, that the resistive force is proportional to the velocity squared and your life would be uh, much better. Move on to question 16. The, which amount of, um, of energy is not equal to 2,400? The energy transferred in 15 seconds by a machine of power 160 watts. Okay, so let's go for this one. You know that power is going to be your energy transferred divided by time or your work done per unit time. So your energy is going to be your power times your time, which is 160 times 15. And that's basically um, 2,400. Right, so that's wrong because we want to find which one is not. Um, if you go to uh, to this one, right, this is going to be your kinetic energy, which is going to be one half m v squared, which is going to be one half times your m, which is twelve, times your v, which is twenty squared. It's going to be half of twelve is six times twenty squared, four hundred. It's going to be two thousand four hundred. That is correct. So this is wrong. Um, then if you move on to the last one which is the work done by a gas um, in expanding okay um, the work done by a gas in expanding against a constant external pressure of that um, like I said work done in this case you change in volume right so there's going to be 120 times 10 to the power of um, 3 times 0 0.020 and if you do that computation that's going to give you um, 2400 joules okay but if I go in for A um, if I go for A okay if I'm going to try A I'm going to have the decrease in gravitational potential energy there's going to be mgh the mass is 60 that times 10 times the h which is 40 60 times 10 is 600 600 times 40 there's going to be 24000 so that is wrong right so the answer is that is um wrong because it's not 2400 so the answer is going to be um a so you just had to f just calculate and figure out which one is not 2400 question 19 we're given a hammer right so the hammer is hitting a nail okay with 10 joules of kinetic energy and it pushes it five millimeters into the plank and want to find the approximate force that is acting on the nail when it moves through five millimeters both the hammer um, are um, reach into collision right so it means that all the energy that is going to um, be used in the kinetic energy is just going to be transferred as a force right so I know that the work done okay what work is done the work done is driving the nail through five millimeters so the work done is going to be equal to your force times your distance D Right, so your force is going to be equal to your work done divided by your distance d. Right, so your work done is going to be 10. 10 joules is your work done divided by the distance that is moved, which is 5 times 10 to the power of negative 3. They're just going to give you an answer of 2,000. Um, 2,000 newtons. The answer is going to be um, d. Okay, a number of identical um, springs are joined in four arrangements. Which arrangement has the same spring constant as a single spring? Um, guys, I did make a video on springs in series and springs in parallel. So if you're still unclear on, on that, I would recommend you go and watch that on my channel. But basically, this is a video that sort of explains how these combinations are connected. But basically, I'm just going to rush so that you just have a basic understanding of how it was supposed to be done. But I really want you guys to understand things in depth. But because of time, we can't really go into every single nitty gritty. But watching that video should be able to help you. But basically what you need to know is that this is basically a series connection and in a series connection um f right what is shared is the extension but the force is going to be the same if i have two neurons here if i have a certain force f this guy is going to experience the same force then that guy is also going to experience the same force but what they share is the extension right so i know that um f is going to be f total is going to be um so since they're sharing the extension I know that the x total 
um, will be equal to x1 plus x2, right? But since f is equal to kx, I'll be left with f over k equal to f um, over k1 plus f over k2, okay? So 1 over kt, which is the total extinction, Okay, um, so we have 1 over kt, which is the total extinction being equal to 1 over k1 plus 1 over k2. So this is basically a generalization that we make for all springs that will be um, in series. Okay, so whenever you have right, springs in series, Okay, so it's a generalization that you're going to make. Whenever you have springs that will be in series, it's going to be 1 over kt being equal to 1 over k1 plus 1 over k2, you know, and so and so forth. But whenever things are in parallel, right, it's going to be, um, in parallel, it's going to be the force that's shared, right, f1 plus f2, but the extension will be the same. So kx will be equal to kx1 plus kx2, since the extension is the same, they cancel out. So a k total will be equal to k1 plus k2. So whenever things are in parallel, this is parallel, you just add the spring constants. Whenever things are in series, you just say you add 1 over k, 1 over k. So in this case, since they're in series, I have k here, I have k here. So it's going to be 1 over k, okay, plus 1 over k. 1 plus 1 is 2. So there's going to be 2 over k, right? So basically, but, right, it's 1 over k, which is equal to 2 over k. So it's going to be to the power of negative 1, because 1 over k to the power of negative 1 is just k plus. So there's going to be k over 2. So my, my spring constant is going to be k over 2. Okay, and then if I move on to, um, to b, I'm going to have k plus k. My spring constant is going to be 2k. Okay, then if I move here, I said already, these guys have k over 2. These guys have k over 2. If I add this 2 up, I get k. So that's um, a, a, a spring constant that is the same as a single spring. So the answer is, is c. Because here, since I have um, k here, here plus here, k plus k is going to be 2k. Then if I'm going to add this, it's going to be 1 over 2k plus 1 over k to the power of negative 1. Right? The common denominator is going to be 2k, 2k into 2k, um, 1, we have 1 plus k into k, we have 2, so there's going to be 2k divided by 3, right, so the answer just has to be c. When question 21, we're given a sample for material that is stretched by tensile force to a point beyond its elastic limit, so it's a spring, it's going to be stretched, 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 until it exceeds its elastic limit, so it's going to be break, broken, so it's just going to be deformed. The tensile force is then reduced to zero. That force is going to be reduced to zero. Then the graph is shown. What is the network done on the sample? What network has been done? So the work that has been done to reach this point, which is the point M, right, is basically the area, okay, the area under the graph, right? So basically it's just going to be the area under the graph. And the area under the graph is basically the area under the whole graph. You're just going to be this area here. Okay. So this is what we're looking at. So the area under the graph to reach M, right? So the area under the graph um, to reach M, the work done to reach M is going to be X plus Y plus Z. So the work done to return to the original position so we're gonna go from here, from point M, up until we arrive at point, I don't know, X. I don't, I'll, X, we've already used X, let's say point B. It's gonna be the area underneath the graph for that region. It's gonna be the area underneath the graph for this region specifically, right? So this is the region that we're now looking for when we're now going down and reaching that point. Okay, so the work that is gonna be done for this one is going to be z so the network is just the difference which is just going to be this is the net right the network that is still left just going to be 
okay x plus y x plus y which is b so we're gonna do a lot of work in reaching point m x plus y plus z but then we're gonna lose some work in us going to um that point which is gonna be z but we're still left with x plus y which is the network that has been done on the sample but the sample is going to do some work for z but work has been done on the sample x plus y plus z so the network that has been done will just be x plus y uh, move on to question 22 two sound waves of um, frequencies 250 hertz um okay and 300 and um so we have 250 hertz and 300 hertz the speed of sound is 340 what is the difference in the wavelengths what do we know the golden wave equation you should know this by head v is going to be equal to f lambda so it means that lambda is going to be equal to v divided by f right that's the golden equation that you need to know so for case one okay so for case one we're going to have a value of v which is 340 divided by your frequency which is going to be 250 then that's going to give you okay 340 divided by 250 um 1.36 meters Okay, then we're go to, going to go to case two. Okay, for case two, we're still going to be having V over F, which is going to be 340 divided by... Divided by 300 hertz, um, that's going to be 1.1333. Then your difference is just going to be 1.36, um, subtract 1.1333, just going to have 0 0.23 meters. Then the answer is going to be um, A, very important. Move to question 23. Um, which electromagnetic wave have the wavelengths 10 to the power of negative 2, 10 to the power of negative 5, 10 to the power of negative 10, 10 to the power of negative 13? Guys, whenever it comes to wavelength ranges, there is no test book. I repeat, there is no test book on Earth that's ever going to give you wavelengths. You're going to have to do them on your own. So you just have to know them by your head. Um, yes, the test book will give you, but there's no examination that's going to give you these ranges unless you have them memorized in your head. They're going to be mnemonics. They can be, it can be either, you know, whatever way you have of understanding them, please use it because there's no way any question paper is going to give you these ranges. So basically, um, we have Robert um, is very ugly except Grace. Okay, so we have R-M-I-V um, U-X-Q, right? So these are the ranges that we have and these are the wavelengths for radio is 1 to 10 to the power of 6, micro 10 to the power of negative 3 to 1 meter, for infrared 10 to the power of negative 3 to 700, for visible light, it's 400 to 700. For ultraviolet, it's 400 to 10 to the power of negative 8. For um, X-rays, it's 10 to the power of negative 8 to 10 to the power of negative 11. For gamma, it's 10 to the power of negative 11 and 10 to the power of negative 14. So for 10 to the power of negative 2, there's going to be microwaves, um, 10 to the power of negative 5, infrared, 10 to the power of negative 10, X-rays, 10 to the power of negative 13, gamma. Then the answer is going to be um, B. Very important for you to have that in mind. Move on to question 24. Which statements concerning a stationary wave is correct? Um, all particles between two successive nodes oscillate in phase. So if we have two successive nodes, all the particles are going to be oscillating in phase. Okay, so if you have one node that is here, right, and then you have another node, all the particles are going to be oscillating in phase. That is true. If all the particles are moving down, they're all moving down. If all the particles are moving up, they're all moving up in between two nodes. If that wasn't the case, if some were moving up, some moving down, how would it maintain that shape? It wouldn't be possible. So between two nodes, all particles are supposed to be moving up and some are supposed to be moving down. Um, so the answer is A. But again, it's not about the correct answer. It's also about knowing why some of the answers are wrong. So if you look at B, the amplitude of the stationary wave is equal to the amplitude of one of the waves? No, because the amplitude of the stationary wave, the resultant amplitude, is found by adding the two amplitudes of the two waves. The wavelength of the stationary wave is equal to the separation of two adjacent nodes? No, the wavelength is node to node to node. So this will be lambda. There is no displacement of a particle at an antinode. Come on, guys. We know that it is at a node that is where we don't have any displacement. At an antinode, we're always going to have um, displacement. Very important. Continuous water waves are diffracted through a gap. So we have diffraction occurring um, in a barrier in a ripple tank, which change will cause the diffraction of the waves to increase. Okay, so what do we know? We know that um, if everything remains constant, just reducing the width of the gap would cause the diffraction to increase. Because diffraction is maximum when the wavelength 
um, when the wavelength and the gap are almost equal. So when wavelength and gap are equal, that is where we have a maximum diffraction. Okay, so maximum diffraction almost occurs when that is the same. So by us reducing the gap, by us reducing the width of the gap, we're increasing the probability of the wavelength actually being equal to the gap. If the gap is actually way smaller than the wavelength, again, much better, the diffraction will actually be much greater. So by us reducing the width of the gap, making the gap as small as it can possibly be, we can therefore be able to increase the chances of diffraction. Um, increasing the frequency has nothing to do with the red diffraction. Reducing the wavelength has nothing to do with that. But by um, reducing the width, we can therefore be able um, to increase the diffraction of the waves. Okay? Move on to question 26. Um, a parallel beam uh, is 450. In, on an, um, is incident normally on a diffraction grating, has, uh, which has 300 lines per millimeter. What is the um, total number of intensity maximas observed? Okay. Um, the, we have the famous diffraction equation. Just knowing that equation, guys, will save you through so much trouble when it comes to these questions. What is the equation? We know that d sine theta is equivalent to n lambda. So we want to find n. n is going to be equal to d sine theta divided by lambda, right? Um, okay. In this case, our d is if 300 lines have 1 millimeter, one line is going to be 1 over 300 millimeters. So 300 millimeters is times 10 to the power of negative 3 in meters. Right? If 300 lines have 1 millimeter, one line will be 1 over 300 times um, 10 to the power of negative 3 meters. Times sine. Sine is 30, is 90 degrees, because it's normally. Normally, when sine is 90 degrees, then your lambda is 450 times 10 to the power of negative 9, because it's nano. That's going to give you an n of, um, of 7. So what this means is that you're going to have something like this. Okay, this is going to be your um, your central fringe, which is where we have zero order. So you're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, at 7 like this. So this is when I have, you're going to have it incident normally. But if there's 7 on that side, right, there can also be another in 7 on this other side. Because remember, it works both ways. It either goes up or below, right? So it's either 1 is here or 1 is there. 2 is there, 2 is there, and stuff like that. 7, right? So since there's 7 on that side and 7 on that side, um, it's going to be 7 plus 7, which is going to be 14. But if you look at this, this is a central fringe. It was never counted. The 7 counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 7, but it doesn't include this central fringe. So we're going to be have uh, 14 plus 1. That's going to give you an answer of 15. So this n refers to 7, 7 above, 7 below, but we didn't include the central fringe. Always include the central fringe. Always add a 1 there. That's going to be um, 17. Very important for you to be thinking of that. Question 27. We'll be given fringes of separation x that are observed on a screen of uh, distance 1. Then whenever I see a double slit, I'm going to have lambda um, is equivalent to ax divided by d. Okay. That is illuminated um, by yellow light of uh, wavelength 600 um, nanometers. Okay. Um, a reach distance from the slit would uh, fringes of the same separation x be observed when using blue um, light of wavelength 400 nanometers. Okay, so from this expression, I know that x is going to be equal to lambda times d divided by a, right? Okay, so it means that I'm going to have for the first one, I'm going to have 600 um, times 10 to the power of negative 9 times d, which is 1.0 um, divided by a. Okay, so that's going to be my value of x. But I know that d um, is going to be ax um, divided by lambda. Okay, because I want to find the value of d. At what distance from the slit should I place it? Um, we have the same separation x, meaning that the value of x is going to be the same. Right? Um, so lambda, we have it 400 nanometers, and the value of x is going to be the same. So we're going to have a um, times, okay, 600 times 10 to the power of negative 9 times um, um, times 1 
divided by a over your lambda which is 400 times 10 to the power of negative uh, 9 and a cancel out we are left with um, if you look at it carefully we're left with um, 600 times 10 to the power of negative 9 divided by 400 times 10 to the power of negative 9 then that's going to give us a total answer of um, 1.50 meters right very important um, for you to be thinking of that so the answer is going to be um, D okay when question 28 this is electric fields we no longer do them this is electric fields okay they're no longer part of our syllabus so we'll not be answering this question question 29 that is also electric fields um, and we'll no longer be answering that if you're doing the syllabus from 2022 electric fields are no longer the syllabus so we're not answering this question as well um, okay question 30 is where we're going to start um, there is a current in a resistor for an unknown time. Which two quantities can be used to calculate the energy dissipated by the resistor? I know that V is going to be equal to the work done per unit charge. Then this work done can be the energy okay, um, dissipated okay, in the resistor. Okay, So what this means is that the work done is going to be equal to V times Q okay so V is going to be the potential difference okay the potential difference times um, so if I have the potential difference and I have the total charge I can be able to find the work done so I need the potential difference as well as the total charge so where do I have potential difference in charge the total charge and the potential difference so the answer is going to be c since v is going to break down over q um for me to find the work done it's going to be v times q that should also be able to get me the work done very important question 31 um two copper wires um of equal lengths are connected in parallel the potential difference is applied across the ends of this parallel arrangement where s is diameter this and yt is diameter that what is the uh, value of the ratio of current in s divided by the current in T. Okay, so I'm going to do a little diagram here to show you how this is going to be um, looking like so that, you know, the more you draw diagrams, the more you can visually see how everything is going to be arranged. So you're going to have a battery. Okay, we're going to have a battery here. Right, this is our battery. Okay, then we're going to have this scenario here where we have wire S. Okay, then we're going to have um, this scenario here where we have wire T um, here okay so basically this is going to be my little arrangement right um, so I'm told that they're in parallel so it means that the V across this is going to be the same but the current is going to be different okay so I'm gonna start for S right and then I'm gonna go and then for find for T um, and all that stuff so for S for S, I know that the resistance is going to be equal to um, rho L divided by A. Okay, that's something that we should know. But I've been asked to find the ratio, right, from the question. I've been asked to find the ratio of the current in S um, uh, to the current in T. Okay, so I want to find um, the current in S to the current um, in T. But what do I know? I know that V is going to be equal to IR. Therefore, I... Mama! Mama! Okay, but I know that I is going to be equal to um, V divided by R. Okay? So it means that um, from this calculation, if I have V divided by RS, um, divided by V, divided by RT... I should be able to get my calculation. Okay, so this is equal to V over RS times RT over V. V and V cancel out. Therefore, I'm going to have RT divided by RS. The ratio of the resistance in R in RT to the ratio of the resistance um, in RS. Right. So this is basically 
um, the, the relationship that I'm just going to be left with. Okay, so um, let's remove this. We don't need all of this. Okay, so this is basically the relationship that we know, right? That RT um, divided by RS should give me that. Okay, so right, what do I know? What else um, do I know? I know that R okay, is going to be equal to rho L divided by A. So it means that um, the rho times the L of T divided by the area of T divided by the rho times the length of S divided by the area of S should be equal to my calculation. Okay. Um, okay, if this cancel out, but I've been told that they are of equal lengths. So it means that the length um, and this length are equal. So I'll be left with um, basically rho um, divided by the area of T times the area of S divided by rho. This cancel out. So basically I'm left with the area of S divided by the area of T. Okay, but since it's a wire, I know that the area is going to be pi r squared, which is pi d squared divided by 4. Okay, so I'm going to have pi d of s squared divided by 4 over pi d of t squared divided by 4. Okay, so I'm going to have pi, the diameter of s, um, I have 3 millimeters and 1.5 millimeters. Okay, so the diameter of s, um, of s is 3. Okay, so we're going to have 3 squared divided by 4 times our 4 over pi 1.5 squared. 4 and 4 cancel out, pi and pi cancel out. So I'm just going to be left with 3 squared divided by 1.5 squared. Okay, so um, it's just going to be 3 over 1.5 squared. 3 over 1.5, that's going to be 2. 2 squared is going to be um, 4. Okay, so that is going to be 2. 2 squared is going to be 4. So my answer is going to be um, 4. Okay, so very important for you um, to be thinking of that. When question 32, I'm given a 100 ohm uh, resistor that is able to conduct a current with a changing direction and magnitude as shown in that diagram. Um, okay, so um, we want to find the mean power dissipated in the resistor. So how do you do this? We want to find the mean power dissipated in the resistor. Okay, we know that power is basically um, the work done per unit time. Okay, okay, but I know that V is equivalent to the work done per unit charge. Therefore, the work done will be equal to V times Q. So your power is going to be equal to V times Q divided by time. But Q is going to be equal to IT. Therefore, I is going to be equal to Q over T. Okay, so what this tells me is that my power Okay, what this tells me is that my power is going to be equal to V times I, right? Basically, my power is going to be equal to V times I, right? But I'm only given I here, but um, V is equal to IR. Hence, my power is going to be equivalent to I squared R, right? But here I want to find the mean power. Okay, here I want to find the mean power. How do I do this? How do I do this from this question, right? I have the maximum current that I'm getting here. Then I have the minimum current that I'm getting here. So the average should be the max power plus the minimum power divided by 2. Right? That should be the average that I can get. What the maximum value that I have? What is the lowest value that I have? And if I divide that by 2, if I find the range, 
So if I just find the max, um, so I have the maximum, then I have the minimum. If I add them, then I divide by two, I should be able to get the average, the mean power dissipated because you have the highest and you're also capturing the lowest. So you're basically getting the mean power that has been dis uh, dissipated, right? So the minimum is two, the minimum is negative one, right? So mean power in this case is going to be equal to our max power plus our mean power Okay, divided by two, right? Our max power is two squared times 100 plus negative one squared times 100 divided by two. That's just going to be 500 divided by two. That's just going to be um, 250. So the answer is going to be um, C. Very important for you to be thinking of that. Which graph shows the IV characteristics of a filament lamp Remember, um, this is something that you should just know, right? You should know that this is the graph for a metallic um, conductor, okay? Then you should know the graph for a diode, um, a graph for a diode. It's simply just the normal graph that we know, you know, graph like this, right? But this is a graph for filament lamp, okay? This is a graph for filament lamp. How do I know this? I just try to draw an F, right? So this sort of looks like an F, like so, right? So that's basically one easy way you can remember the graph of a filament lamp. It looks like an F, um, like so, right? If you're if you draw like me, you should be able to get um, that F1 correct, right? So the graph of a filament lamp is just going to be like that. Um, moving on to question um 34 in the circuit shown x is a variable resistor whose resistance can be changed from 5 to 500 the mf of the battery is 12 um it is it has negligible internal resistance what is the maximum range of values of potential difference across the output okay so um so we're gonna so we have 5 to 500 right i know that resistance is shared based um, okay, I know that the potential difference, right, or the voltage that you get, right, the potential difference is based on the resistance that you have. So there's a direct relation between your resistance and the potential difference that you're going to get. If you have a bigger resistance, therefore, a lot of power is going to be dissipated in, or a lot of work is going to be done in moving towards that component, hence a greater PD. If you have a lower resistance, you also need a lower PD. So in this case, I have two assumptions. The first assumption is I'm assuming that X has the highest that it's going to have, which is 500, because I want to find the range. So I'm mainly interested in the highest and the lowest. It's going to be the lowest where it's going to be 5. So it means that it's going to be shared based on the resistance that you have. So for A, so for case 1, it's going to be 500 divided by 500 plus 40 um, times 12. Right, so 500 divided by 500 plus 40 times 12, which is going to be 11.1. Okay, then we have case two. Right, so for case two, it's going to be five divided by five plus 40 times 12. Then that's going to just be um, 1.3. Right, 1.3. Okay. So it means that the range is going to be from, um, so it means that my range is just going to be from 1.3 to 11.1. .1. Anything other than that will lie in between. So the answer is going to be um, A. But in question 35, there is a current of P to R um, in the resistor network as shown. The potential difference between P and Q, P and Q is 3, okay. Um, potential difference between Q and R is 6, Q and R is 6. Um, which row is correct? So I want to find the potential difference between Q and S and the potential difference between S and R. Okay, so I know that these two guys, so I know that these guys, right, and then these guys are in parallel, right? And it's very important. And it's very important for you, right? So I know that these guys. Okay, so I know that these guys, okay, I know that these guys and um, these guys, right, are basically, um, these two guys are basically in parallel. 
Okay, so whenever they're in parallel, it means that those things will have the same um, voltage, right? So it means that if I have nine, if I have a total of nine here, I must also have a total of nine here. So it means that for me to have nine, I need to have a four here, right? So the total output can be nine. So in order for the total output to be nine, I'm gonna need to have a four over there so that the total can be nine. So it means that across here, right, I'm gonna have four volts, right? Then from Q to S, I'm comparing potential, right? I'm comparing potential. So if I had nine, it means that when I'm at this point, I'm gonna be left with six, okay? If I had nine, it means that at this point, I'm gonna be left with four. So it means that the difference Potential difference is the difference in potential. If something is going to move from here to here, there's four here, there's six, then that means I'm going to have two, right? Two volts here. The difference in potential between point S and point Q is two. So that is what I'm going to get here. The difference in potential, okay? Which is going to be two volts. So it means that if current is going to move in this direction, it's going to split based on the setting resistance, and this one is going to experience two volts because potential is the difference between point A and point B. If you remember, I said I have nine here. Mean that if I had nine here, right, then it's gonna to reduce to six. My potential difference is going to be three. So in the similar sense, if I had five here, I'm left with four at this point. A nine here, I'm left with six at this point. Six minus four, I'm gonna have two at this point. I hope that makes sense. So between Q and S, it's going to be two. Between S and R, it's going to be four. And my answer is going to be um, A. Very important for you guys to be thinking of this. Uh, moving on to, um, to question 36. Two resistors of resistance R1 and R2 are connected in parallel. What is the combined resistance between X and Y? What do I know? I know that if things are connected in parallel, we have this low, one over R total, is going to be equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Okay, why is this law correct? It comes from the fact that V is equal to IR, and since things are in parallel, V is the same, but current is shared. So I is going to be equal to V over R. So the I total will be equal to R, uh, V over R1 plus V over R2, but V is the same, they all cancel out. So you just be left with a ratio um, of the resistances. So it is that ratio of the resistances that we are mainly interested in whenever we'll be making these calculations, right? So it is usually most of the time that ratio that we're very interested in. So if you look at this, um, it means that one over, okay, if you look at this, it means that one over my R total will be equal to one over R1 plus one over R2 to the power of negative one, to the power of negative one. So I'm just gonna have RT be equivalent to R1 times R2, which is R1 plus R2, all of that to the power of negative one. Negative one just means invert. So you're gonna have R1 times R2 over R1 plus R2, that's going to be um, B. So it's very important for you um, to be thinking of that. Move on to question 37. We have a voltmeter that is used to monitor the operation of an electric motor. The motor speed is controlled by a variable resistor. A fixed resistor is used to limit the speed. Um, the current in the motor is gradually in, uh, changed. In which circuit is the voltmeter reading proportional to the current in the motor? So the current in this motor has to change. Okay, current has to change. But I know one thing. I know that this and this and this, they're all in series. Okay, so for the current for it to change, what does it mean? It means that the resistance, it basically just means that the resistance of this guy has to change. Since it's a variable resistor, you can vary that resistance. And by varying that resistance, the overall current in this circuit has to change because you're changing, um, because you're changing the resistance of that, it's going to affect the overall speed at which, or the rate at which um, charge is going to flow throughout this whole circuit. Okay, so, to change the current, we need to change the variable resistor, right? And then if you look at A and um, and D, right? So I just want you to look at A. If you look at A, um, 
V will never change. We've been told that the voltmeter reading is proportional to the current. So it means that if the current changes, right, the voltmeter reading is also supposed to change. But since I've been told it's proportional, it means that if the voltmeter, okay, if the voltmeter reading um, increases, right, then the current should also increase because, well, it's proportional. But if I look at A, V will never change because V is the total output, right? If this resistance changes, that is going to get, maybe if it increases, it's going to create a greater PD. This one's going to get a less PD. But the overall V here will never change because we're, you're just measuring the overall combined output, which will always be constant. So in A, it's always going to be constant. And if you look at D, this is just measuring the EMF. Guys, come on. This is just going to measure the EMF, and that will never change. So it means that I'm only left with B and C. I need to look at which will I have a proportional uh, relationship between the current in the motor and the voltmeter reading that I'm getting. Okay? So if I look at this, right, I know that V is going to be equal to IR. If I increase the resistance of this guy, okay, if I increase the resistance of this guy, to um, increase the resistance, right, it means that um, by increasing the resistance, the overall resistance of this whole system increases. Hence, the current decreases. Okay, hence, the current decreases. So in this case, the current has decreased. So since it's proportional, I also expect the voltmeter reading to decrease, right? Because I've increased the total resistance, the current has decreases. Hence, I also expect that the voltmeter reading is also going to decrease, right? Then if I look at V, since this is going to get a greater resistance, so if the resistance here is going to, great, to be greater, it means that the potential difference across this is also going to increase, meaning that the potential difference across this is going to decrease. So it means that I'm going to get a smaller, um, a smaller voltmeter reading here. Okay, a smaller voltmeter reading here, a smaller current here, that's proportional. So the answer has to be D. So you want to find a situation where the voltmeter changes and the current also changes, but proportionally. The current decreases, the voltmeter reading also decreases. So basically that is what you need um, to be considering. Move on to C. Um, if you use the same analogy, um, if, I, um, if R is going to increase, Right? If R is going to increase, it means that the current, right, the current is going to decrease, sure. But if R increases, the PD across this is going to increase. Greater resistance, greater PD. So it means that the V, if the current is decreasing, the PD, however, is going to increase. And that's wrong. Because they need these guys are not proportional. They're actually inversely proportional. So um C would be wrong. Okay, I hope that makes sense. When question 30, um 38. Which statement describes beta negative decay in terms of a simple um, quark model? So beta negative decay is basically we have a neutron, right? We have one zero, which is a neutron that decays into a proton. Okay, one one a proton plus it releases a beta negative um, particle plus um, it then releases an anti electron neutrino. Okay. This is an anti um, electron, okay, neutrino, right? And then this is our beta negative particle. So we want to find the changes, which happens. A down quark changes to an up quark, okay, but in, t in terms of um, quark composition, right, a neutrino to change into a proton, we know that a, a neutron is basically um, an up quark, a down quark, a down quark. But a proton is an up quark, two up quarks, and a down quark. So it means that during beta negative decay, a down quark is converted to um, an up quark, okay, plus the release of that beta negative particle and um, the electron anti neutrino. So a down quark changes to an up quark, correct, and an electron and an electron neutrino um, is deposited. That is correct because you have a down quark. Um, and then we have an electron neutrino and an electron anti neutrino. So the answer is going to be A. Okay. Um, question 39. 
um, in 39 is going to be this is a positron okay this is a positron so you're going to start with a proton 1 1 p okay so since a positron we're going to start with a proton and the proton can go nowhere else except decay to a neutron plus it's going to uh, release a beta plus um, particle plus this is going to be an electron an electron neutrino okay so we're gonna have a proton going to a neutron and a proton neutron posi neutron uh, sorry so it's gonna be a proton neutron um, positron electron neutrino so the answer is going to be um, D okay move on to question 40 we said about the alpha scattering experiment provides evidence for the existence of the nucleus so the alpha scattering experiment commenced Rutherford wanted to discover if indeed the nuclear structure is as um, as hypothesized so he fired um, alpha particles at a gold foil then he observed what was happening right you know and rumor has it that when he actually woke up what he discovered shocked him that he was afraid to step on the ground as if the ground would, would um would eat him you know those are some of the consequences of studying physics too much you know you start to hallucinate some stuff right so if you have alpha particle scattering experiment the results were as follows most particles uh, most particles went through and deflected okay went through undeflected right that was one of the biggest observations that we made and why what this uh, what did this entail it told us that the atom is made up of mostly empty space okay mostly um, empty space okay the second observation that we um, we found from this was that some particles were deflected okay some particles were deflected right some particles were deflected okay um, were indeed deflected or scattered right but this was at small angles okay so they were scattered at small angles what did the, what did this tell us it told us that the atom um, has a center which is indeed the nucleus right that is small but positively charged so it's small but it's positively charged we also had another observation right which was observation three some were deflected at large angles okay some were deflected um, at large angles right large angles basically where theta is greater than 90 degrees okay um, and what this this tell us again it told us that um, it is the the nucleus okay is small because it's some particles right it's dense because they're able to bounce off um, when once they're deflected so it's dense or mass is at the center concentrated at the center then it also gave us um, that they're also positively charged right, so basically these are some of the observations that we made some went through and deflected atom is made up of mostly empty space some were deflected but at small angles so the atom is a center that is small some particles were deflected at large angles theta greater than 90 which gave us an, a hint that the nucleus is small dense but also still positively charged then this was able to give us an idea of a nucleus that is made up of protons um, that is made up of uh, neutrons okay so it's made up of protons that is made up of uh, of neutrons and then that has um, electrons orbiting around so it has electrons then orbiting in shells right with electrons in shells so this then gave us an idea of the structure of the nucleus so which means about the alpha scale provided evidence for the existence of a nucleus, a tiny proportion of the alpha particles were deflected through at large angles. That can only be true.
um, and then we're able to make um, all of these des deductions. So guys, this is my paper. Thank you guys for watching and I really hope that it was helpful. Um, remember, that there is no way that you're going to get all of these questions um, from anywhere, right? Except from these platforms um, like YouTube. There's no teacher who's going to come on earth and give you all the questions that you're going to solve or there's notes and all that stuff. So my advice to you is you're going to need to have your test book. You're going to need to have your syllabus. Then you're going to need to have these questions, right? So solving question papers basically helps you um, get some understanding of what exactly is um, what exactly are these questions and how can they be solved? So you're going to have your test book that's going to give you a basic backbone. Your syllabus is going to give you what exactly is missed and what exactly you need to cover. Then, you know, YouTube videos and question papers are going to give you little tricks, right? Little nuggets that can help you um, solve these questions at ease. So, you know, I really hope that this was helpful and you're able to um, figure out how you can be able to solve some of these questions um, on your own. So do you have a notebook where you write things down? Make it clear and precise and you should be able to do this very well. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one.